Hey, hey, everybody, how's it going? Welcome back to the Square, the Circle Music Channel. It's me again, your old pal Mage, and here we are. We're going to talk about circles and squares, like we always do. Record collecting, music appreciation, and all sorts of wonderful things. Again, thanks for joining me. Uh, if you watched my video last night, I apologize for all the technical difficulties. I wanted to try using a... Um, an area microphone uh, that was a cheap piece of shit and it sounded horrible so I apologize for anyone that uh, had to struggle through watching the video that I posted last night but thanks again for tuning in and watching anyway um, I'll say it again go over to the Instagram visit me there give me a follow say what's up um, and please scroll down in my history and check out all the cool shit that I've been posting for the last year. Uh, specifically speaking, a post from about three weeks ago, look for a little thing that says contest. Don't forget about my contest, everybody. Um, I started this uh, earlier in March and wanted to challenge myself to uh, the 500 subscriber mark. So had a great month of March. I got almost 100 subs in March, so... Still a few days left in the month. Let's keep it rolling. Go do my contest. Tell me your four, your desert island four, because uh, I want to see what you would take. I want to learn about new music. I'm not just doing this as some sort of creepy narcissistic, like, well, I guess I kind of am. <laughs> Maybe a little bit, but this is in the spirit of what we love and what we do. Collecting music and sharing music and appreciating the magic uh, of music and making music so um, that's what this is all about and I want to know what you would take if you were doomed to only four like that's that's some wicked hard shit <laughs> it really is um, and even still like thinking about it more and more I want to change mine but I shouldn't um, but tell me your shit get into my uh, contest. All you have to do is comment, subscribe, say, hey man, this is my name and I subscribe and I'll drop your name into a little hat. And then on May 1st, in another month or so, I'll drop four names. One for each of the selections that you get to take with you to that desert island. So I'm picking four people out of the hat and they all get a cool prize. Go to the video, watch the video. I explain uh, what you're gonna get and how it works, so. There's my spiel once again. Uh, here you are again, you're stuck at the Square the Circle Music Channel where we bullshit about music and we bullshit about collecting vinyl records and all sorts of other, you know, things and, you know, CDs, tapes, ephemera. Uh, that's what we do. It's fun. So I got a topic for you tonight. I recently mentioned how excited I am and I still even thinking about it I have some butterflies like swimming around in my in my chest right now just thinking about all these bands and groups and individuals and artists that are now the floodgates have been opened and everyone's allowed to go out and enjoy enjoy everything perfect timing springtime you know I don't know hopefully people don't sneeze on each other each other too much don't be swapping too much spit folks um but getting to go out and see rock music again, I'm I'm just tickled pink. I got a little bit of the uh, spring fever. I got thumper. <laughs> I got some thumper problems. So um, I'm going to see uh, Greet Death this weekend in Portland. I'm really excited about that. I got tickets to go see uh, this really killer new, like, uh, I don't know. What could you call them? They're just killer hard rock. I'm not going to try to even go any deeper than that. But... Gonna go see them this weekend. Um, fucking King Buffalo's coming to town. Whores are coming to town. Uh, so much stuff going on. And I'm just getting really excited. So in the spirit of, like I said, springtime, all the, the madness is, you know, coming at ya. Um, I wanted to talk about live music. And I've never done a top 10 picks of my favorite live albums. I don't have a ton of live albums in my collection. Um, as I've talked about this before, I don't ever like to let my collection get above 500 pieces. You know, I, I've used lots of numbers. I've said 300, I've said 400, now I'm saying 500, whatever. Um, I really try hard to not let it go 
over that kind of threshold that I've created for myself. Um, otherwise, it's happened before many, many, many times, and I don't have time to enjoy all of it, and that's that really aggravates me. So I don't want to have all this stuff sitting around that I'm just never going to get to. Uh, so, yeah. I don't remember where I was going with this, but let's just get right into it. Live albums. So I was saying I don't have a ton of records, and so I didn't have a ton to choose from. But I was able to whip out 10, so let's go through it. Uh, these are not going to have any type of pecking order to them. They're not going to, you know, be an order of importance by any means. But um, let's just go through them. These are my 10 favorite live albums. Uh, first... One that um, everyone's going to chuckle, I suppose, maybe. I don't know. Um, this one just reminds me of my childhood. This one reminds me of my mother, specifically speaking. Uh, so I love it. Everyone cherishes Simon and Garfunkel. Uh, but specifically for me, this early 80s kind of thing, this was just like, you know, constantly spinning in the household when I was growing up. Uh, and their concert in the park, or whatever they call it. Yeah, the concert in Central Park. Um but yeah, they put on a benefit to like clean up Central Park um, as far as crime and whatever else was going on uh, in the park in the early 80s. But um, yeah, huge benefit concert, supposedly <laughs> when people were, rep were reporting about it in 1981 when they recorded this um, in Central Park, New York, people were reporting and just how, you know, it was just huge. It was just the hugest thing ever. And uh I guess it was reported that there was a half a million people in um, Central Park during this concert, the night of this concert. And then in all reality, talking to like event coordinators and people and police and whoever else, you know, they were like, yeah, that spot in the park, there, it can't hold over 50,000 people. Like, no way. <laughs> so kind of off by a little bit of a percentage there. Uh, pretty cool, though, to think and just to look at the crowd and see the crowd, you know, there to just enjoy killer, you know, Simon and Garfunkel. Really great list of songs, you know, 50,000 strong. Must have been a really cool night. Um, I bet the energy in that place was just something else. Uh, could be said about a ton of live shows, obviously, but this one, I mean, look at, you know, all the wonderful hits that they play, just all their most classic. Side one in itself is just like, okay, sometimes you can just spin side one, you know, the first disc, and that's all you need. Miss Robinson, uh, Homeward Bound, America, me and Julio down by the schoolyard, and then Scarborough Fair. Boom. That's <laughs> like, drop your pants. <laughs> yeah, get in the back. <laughs> Fucking, that's all they needed to do right there. But there's still, you know, two more discs, three more sides of, uh, you know, wonderful, wonderful hits by these guys. Folk legend Simon and Garfunkel. I love the shit out of this album. Like I said, it was on fucking repeat in my household when I was a kid. So, love that one dearly. Uh, next one on the list, uh, a fucking rocker, like a killer. I mean, this, I think it's been, you know, I mean, obviously it's been said by thousands of people forever, but it's been said by big critics, um, that write for big publications and whatever else, like saying that this is the greatest live recording of all time, uh, or the greatest, the greatest live rock recording, you know, of a rock band, um, ever. And I, I can agree to a certain degree. With that, but yeah, of course, Live at Leeds by The Who. 1970, right? They recorded it um, at Leeds. Uh, I think it was, I think they said 1970, but they just, I guess, had been, you know, just dropped The Who, or I mean, sorry, um, Tommy. And um, yeah, so uh, that the Tommy was 1969, right? Yeah, so I think they had just dropped that. They had kind of like really changed their, uh, their attitude, their sound. Dude, from the moment you drop the needle on this shit, that first song, what's it called? The Young Man Blues. Yeah. Ugh. The sound recording on this album, that must be why a lot of critics, too, uh, say it's just the greatest rock and roll live recording ever. The, the sound recording on this is just phenomenal. You can hear every inst instrument with absolute clarity, up close and personal. Just a beautiful recording, whoever did. Uh, yeah, whoever engineered this shit did a magnificent job. But uh, unfortunately, I have a copy that has none of the goddamn, you know, insert that poster, all that stuff, none of the ephemera. Um, I've never read at 
length or detail about the show and the place and the recording or, you know, shit that may have happened. If anyone fucking died, like, who knows? I'm sure there was, you know, many thousands of people <laughs> at this show. And it's just the whole B-side is basically one song, isn't it? It's just my generation. They do, do, they, they do a 15 minute version of my generation on the B-side. It's just fucking... It's so awesome. It rocks so fucking hard. I love the shit out of this album. So definitely had to be on my top 10. Best live recordings. Okay, change in speed here, change in pace. Um, this is something that I love. I talk about a lot. Um, I love ambient electronic and soft music, and I especially love Wyndham Hill Records, that uh, label out of the late 70s, early 80s, new jazz, fusion jazz, soft jazz, whatever the fuck you want to call it, but they mix it with all kinds of wonderful world folk sounds, so you get a lot of Celtic flavor, and you get a lot of East Asian flavor, and you get all kinds of fun stuff, and all these great, fantastic, you know, artists that all get together and uh, share their talents on stage. This is an evening with the Wyndham Hill artists. Uh, live, I think they recorded this, let's see, it was 1982, and they recorded it on the uh, East Coast in Boston. Um, yeah, and I guess uh, reading about this, um, they said that this was kind of like, um, not really a test, but just kind of like, you know, they it was a small venue, they just wanted to see, you know, what ticket sales would be like, and how it would be received in the arts community or whatever, and, you know, eventually the next year, they booked they booked Carnegie Hall and sold out Carnegie Hall and blah blah blah. So yeah, brought to you by of course you know William Ackerman and um, uh, who's uh, the other guy that uh, plays the piano George Winston. Um, they co-own this, but yeah, this label is magnificent. You have famous names that sat in that night. Michael Hedges played guitar all night long, uh, did some solo tracks, but also did stuff with everybody. And of course, William Ackerman uh, plays guitar all over this album throughout the whole thing. I think he's on every single selection. Um, but George Winston, Winston comes in and plays some piano. Liz Story, I've talked about her. She comes in and plays some jazz piano with them. Uh, huge names like uh, Michael Manring, and you know he's a bass player and a, and a quartet of his own. And uh, yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, a huge laundry list of just amazing talents and amazing names. And they all had this incredibly beautiful live concert, of course, recorded. Uh, the engineering is masterful. This was, you know, early 80s. And uh, whoever, I'm sure a team of super nerds with, you know, guy perms and, you know, mustaches. And they were probably on that shit. Um, but it, it sounds amazing. So everybody check this out. If uh, you like anything of this ilk, which I sure do, if you like that cool jazz. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's that one, two, three down. Let's talk about the next one. Love prog rock. Everyone loves symphonic rock and prog rock. I know I do. This is one of the greatest uh, live progressive rock recordings that I can think of. Um, save maybe a couple more <laughs> here on my uh on my little top 10 list but this one comes in pretty high i love this fucking group so much this is renaissance um live show in uh car at carnegie hall in new york city uh, i believe recorded in 1974 um oh pardon me my i'm glad i wrote down some notes i'm referring to my notes here this was actually recorded in 1976 um but features everything that they were highly popularized for um from the years like 73 74 this has like i mean the whole b-side of the first disc is all the shaharazad you know tales um but yeah they did a lot of stuff from ashes or um ashes are burning on this album uh the ocean gypsy song um cart let's see what else yeah i mean the 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 d side the uh Opposite side of the second disc, um, the entire last song is The Ashes Are Burning. So, um, dude, yeah, Anne Haslin, I think is her name. Love the shit out of her, her vocals and just everything the band does. This was really kind of just the the top of the hill for them from, you know, 73, 74, 75, with those three albums. Um, really leading up to a massive career. This was kind of just, like I said, the pinnacle of their career. They're live at Carnegie Hall double disc masterful recording um and beautiful playing beautiful singing yeah anyone likes symphonic rock check this shit out masterful okay talked about a lot of classic 
you know, albums. I uh, haven't really talked about a lot of newer, newer stuff, new-ish. This is already 20 years old. It's crazy to start seeing all these albums turn 20 and 30 years old. <laughs> I'm starting to feel, I'm starting to feel kind of rickety. I'm starting to feel like an old timer around here, around these parts. But thank goodness for this uh, legendary rock and roll band and this really super cool recording. Um, gosh, this was, you know, this was on repeat for me that summer. Uh, that it came out it came out in 2001 i want to know it came out later than 2001 i think um because this was all recordings from a massive world tour that they did throughout 2001 i'm not sure exactly when they released it if it was that year um all recorded and all released in the same year and you know it's a pretty big undertaking not generally this is you know the great one of the greatest rock bands of all time but you know radioheads i might be wrong 2001 uh Tons of selections, selections from uh, the Kid A and uh, Amnesiac releases. So, but the the thing I love most about this, come to find too, which is weird. I always, it's continuity. It's kind of you know the way it's all pieced together and the way it all kind of flows together. You know, everyone loves live albums for and live music for what it is because it's an overall experience. You know, the whole thing from not maybe not necessarily from beginning to end, but you're getting one big bulk of recording that all kind of just like like i said it's all flown continuity it's all just kind of like being there uh this never had that feeling and i always kind of wondered why it felt really spastic and really kind of as far as like you know the continuity the engineering everything you know, the ups and downs with what was going on it never felt like one you know one experience um you know if, if you feel kind of removed um it feels more just like a like a rock record um, but the audience participation, it always just kind of, like I said, it made me feel kind of like almost kind of awkward and come to find this was recorded many different, um, many different live recordings from around the world when they did that world tour in 2001, some from the holiday bowl in, um, wherever the holiday bowl is, sorry, LA maybe, or on the Hollywood, the Hollywood bowl, my bad, the Hollywood bowl, um, stuff from Oxford in England, um, a couple of recordings from France when they played in France, you know, so you just have like this crazy mishmash of, uh, all, you know, some of their best tunes, uh, but lots of interesting renditions too. Um, the version, the live version of like, um, uh, like spinning plates, it's all just piano, straight piano. He's just playing the song and singing, um, a lot different than both album versions. I think it, it appeared both on the Amnesiac and the Kid A albums but um yeah starting with the national anthem everything they do you know the outro the true love waits that's never appeared on any other album uh, besides i think it made its appearance in the moon shaped pool didn't it uh but yeah love the shit out of radiohead obviously uh this album you know i grew up with it in a sense i mean this came out you know i was already a full-blown adult fucking up my life dropped out of college by the time this came out but um yeah anyway i'll put this down now <laughs> could talk about that for a very long time pardon me while i wet my whistle thanks again folks for joining me this evening talking about some of my favorite live recordings um getting on down the line here i've already talked about uh five or so um let's just let's just stay on this uh Stay on this fun little train here. I love the shit out of these guys. Um, I remember sitting and watching just like a crazy live DVD that they did. Um, right when they kind of broke away and stopped being Bob Dylan's band. Um, I just remember seeing like just like hours and hours of this like DVD. When, when DVD footage of bands like started surfacing, it's like, wow, you can get all this amazing footage for cheap on DVD, like, you know what I'm saying? Like in the early 2000s when this shit was just like, for us Gen Xers, for us kids that were like late 70s, early 80s kids, come 2003, you know, when like DVDs and all this amazing footage from the internet was just like surfacing and, and appearing in your home, you know, like you can, I can sit and watch a four hour documentary about the band, <laughs> I like, can just watch them being how their amazing legendary selves and just watching them all just coked out of their fucking minds just like playing this amazing shit like 
you know, you'd only grown up just like dreaming about it. You never saw footage of it. You never saw it on television, you know? I mean, you, you did to a certain degree, to a certain extent, but never like this raw behind the scenes footage of Rob Robertson, you know, and, and these guys, you know, these uh, fucking legends. But I, I only have volume two of this. I, I didn't realize that initially um, in the seventies it was, um, released in two separate volumes, individual LPs themselves. I always thought it was just a collection. Um, but yeah, I only have part two, uh, but it's the best part <laughs> of that show. It was a New Year's Eve show, 1971 turning into 72 uh, that year. I think they played in uh, New York, probably. I think it was in New York. I don't know. Um, but yeah, fucking badass show it sounds amazing levon helm is one of my favorite drummers i should have i did a show recently here on my channel on the squared circle music channel i did a show about my favorite drummers my favorite rock drummers and i really wanted to include levon helm on there but um he didn't make the cut i don't know I, he ought to have but uh i love the way he just his simplistic laid back drumming and every time there's a a drummer that can you know take the helm <laughs> like Levon does of the band singing and songwriting and just really being a tour de force of, uh, of talent in that group. I'll never forget the day. I was, you know, probably seven or eight years old. My folks used to let that, that the closest thing we got to like, you know, seeing crazy adult shit when I was really young was my folks would let us stay up late and watch Saturday night live when I was growing up. That's the only thing. Cause they, they, they just really felt because, you know, the humor was like borderline, a little bit too crass for kids sometimes. You know, I'm talking, this is like late 70s, 80s, um, SNL. And so some of it was just kind of like, it was super inappropriate for children, but my folks always let us watch it. <laughs> and so I got to see music too. I remember seeing like this collection that Saturday Night Live used to release like every 10 years, every time they would have an anniversary, you know, they would do like a huge long series of like really cool vignettes um, and show all the music that they've had on their show for like decades and decades. And I'll never forget like the 10 year anniversary, watching that 10 year anniversary and watching Levon Helm just fucking kill the night they drove old Dixie down and just watching him play the drums and sing that shit with so much soul. It like, it sparked a fire in me. <laughs> I can credit this dude for really like kind of shaping, you know, what I loved and, and, uh, what it's all about. Dude, they opened the this album with the weight next, the shape I'm in, you know what I mean? Like just killed it all the way, killed it. Um, what's homeboy's name who played the bass and did a, a lot of singing as well in the band. Um, damn it. I can never remember his name. Uh, but he's just on point on this album. He's got that really great, soulful, soft, you know, voice of his while he plays the bass and um, his singing and his delivery and everything is just on point uh, for this show. What a magnificent show. Yeah, I guess I better get part one too. <laughs> I love the shit out of it. Love the band. All right. Did I say, yeah, I said the year 1971 to 1972. Yeah. Cool period. Cool period in rock history. This is pretty close to that. This was another New York show. Um, I love and appreciate uh, this recording so much. It actually has better versions of some of my favorite songs. I've mentioned this again <laughs> on my videos here on my silly channel uh, where I ramble and I had an episode about the you know greatest King Crimson songs ever written. And I talked about um, the song Exiles, um, definitely is one of my favorite songs by King Crimson. And I actually prefer the version, this live version that they do on here just makes my, makes my heart sing, makes my heart and soul sing. The, uh, the Lark's Tongue and Aspic version just uh, feels a little kind of half-baked to me. That was obviously the very beginning of their sessions and getting to know each other, John Wetton and, and Bruford and Fripp, you know, as a three piece and just really kind of like doing an entirely new thing and creating this, amazing stew of what they were doing you know it just it was a bit formative and uh, I really like the cuts off of this live album from 74 it was just way more they had been practicing been touring and just you know hanging out for three years straight and you can tell on this album they do part two of Lark's Tongue that's how they open the show uh 
Lament and then Exiles to end the A side and then Ashbury Park, Easy Money, and they end it with 21st Century Schizoid Man. Um, it's pretty fucking amazing. Like I said, uh, 1974, this was recorded um, in New York City and the album's just called USA or I don't know. I've heard people say it's called the USA album. <laughs> what? No, I think it's just USA. But um, yeah, fucking cool. I love the shit out of this record, especially that song, Exiles, the version they do on this John Wetton. Fucking nails it, dude. <laughs> nails it. Beautiful song. Beautiful song. Okay. Um, moving on down the line again. Oh, my man. This will be on everybody's top 10 greatest live recordings of all time. Always. Um, I'd have to say one of my very, very favorite uh, Cash albums. If not my, ah, it's hard to know. He has so many albums. But the, from Folsom Prison, everybody, Johnny Cash. Um, yeah, I mean, this made this album made him a legend. Uh, he had written that song, I guess, in the 50s. Um, but this performance of it in 1968, right? Pretty sure. Pretty sure it was like 1968. I love this whole amazing fucking letter that he writes to everybody about this whole thing. And why he did what he did and the experience and, you know, the kind of trauma of reliving this experience of being locked away in Folsom prison. <laughs> like, I don't know. Pretty amazing. Uh, all the tunes, dark as a dungeon. I still miss somebody. The cocaine blues, you know, he sings Orms, uh, ends the A-side with Long Black Veil, how haunting and beautiful this version uh, is on this album. You know, he sings a few with, with June on the B-side, or yeah, on the B-side. The Dirty Old Egg Sucking Dog song. <laughs> this fucking album is just absolutely legendary. Everyone ought to have this in their collection. Yeah, look at the man there, man in black. He's giving it his all. Iconic photo as well. You know, one of the greatest, you know, front cover, photo covers ever. Johnny Cash. Folsom Prison. Pretty sure that was 1968. Thanks again for hanging out with me tonight, guys. Um, just two more that I want to throw at you. Uh, pretty fun doing this top ten list. I love live music. I can't wait to start going and seeing some rock and roll again. It makes me so happy. Uh, these guys, boy, I wish they would come to America because uh, these guys, I got to get out there on the floor and just start banging my head to these guys. Oh, man be great to see them uh talking about danish you know super rock jazz fusion heavy jazz uh mastermind three-piece group called pepier uh yep from denmark copenhagen to be specific i think uh but they played the roadburn festival like many 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 groups do especially if you're huge in europe uh, all over europe like these guys are uh, i think that festival is in uh, I want to say the Netherlands. It is. It's in Netherlands, I believe. Um, but yeah, the Roadburn Festival has hosted so many outstanding legendary bands uh, throughout the world. And these guys, like I said, three-piece, you know, stony jazz, rock. It's just, it's, it's too fucking amazing. They play a ton of great stuff. A lot from their early career, their first album. I can never remember the name of their first album. I think it's just self-titled. Um, but then they put out a second one called uh, Stundum. Uh, there's like two tracks that they play off here, um, off of the album Stundum, which is probably, I don't know if it's my very favorite. I think no, their third is my favorite album. But yeah, their second and third album, uh, lots of cuts from their fourth album as well. I think that was it for this one because I, I don't think they had released anything beyond their fourth album when they did this live show. I think this is the one. Did I write it down? When was this recorded? Oh, 2014. Yeah, so I think that that had got them up to their fourth LP that they ever released. So nothing from five and six, obviously, on this one. Or seven. They just released seven this year. Holy shit. I've only listened to it like once or twice. Um, and I remember it being really, really introspective and uh, kind of different from what these guys have done so far in their career. Um, so I really do need to do a super deep dive on their newest album, Seven. Um, gosh, yeah, these guys will never come to America, unfortunately. But um, who knows? Maybe I'll 
maybe I'll retire in the in Nor in Norway, and then I can go see one of my my very favorite new bands, Papier. Check out their uh, live at Roadburn. Fucking sick. Yeah, gotta retire in Denmark or Norway. I don't think they'll have me. Yeah, you know, this is my favorite live album. This is my favorite. I saved it for last because it is my favorite. Um, because they're one of my very favorite bands. I love prog rock. They're, you know, legends of prog rock. I like this a lot more than the Yes Songs album. People are gonna throw stones. Please don't throw stones. Um, the Yes Songs album is so huge. Here's one for you. It is the first Yes album I ever owned. It was, I saw it in the record store. I had just begun, you know, to collect records again uh, as an adult since, you know, decades past. And I knew I was getting into, I was getting into Yes. And I was like, I, I need a Yes album. And that was the first one I saw. It looked so amazing. I thought it was wonderful. I spin the shit out of it. Um, over time, it just kind of felt, it was started to feel kind of stale. Um, I'm not talking shit, everybody. I'm just saying, this is, this is the truth. It's just my opinion here. Um, it started to feel kind of stale, and I thought it was also kind of weird. I mean, obviously, you know, uh, it's a, is it triple? It's either triple or quadruple, maybe even. But anyway, I think it's just a triple LP. Um, halfway through it, it's like it switches from Bill Bruford to Alan White, uh, which isn't really weird because I like Alan White's drumming better anyway. But uh, again, with, you know, the continuity. The continuity just kind of wasn't there. I didn't really like the the sound recording, the engineering of uh, a lot of the, the plays. I think it was mostly all one show, wasn't it? Maybe like two different nights or I don't know. It just all kind of, uh, I didn't get much of a great vibe from it. This one, I get a much better vibe. This is like a bunch of shows from like their best years, in my opinion. Three years, 70, um, 74, 75, 76. So they were on tour. A lot of stuff from Relayer on here, which is one of my very favorite albums of theirs. Probably my second favorite album of theirs. But I love the live version of the Gates of uh, Gates of Delirium and uh, Ritual Part One. Pretty fucking amazing. You know, there's stuff on here from the Tornado years. Um, so then you have Rick Wakeman back in the band. Uh, the first two, obviously, with. Um, Patrick Mraz was touring with them in those years, 74 and 75. Some stuff from 78, 79 on here. I don't know. I just, I really appreciate the fact that they put some of their lesser known, not lesser known, but I mean, you know what I mean? Like, not just the same fucking shit from like Close to the Edge and, you know, the Yes album. You know, it's like, seems like every live show forever every live recording of theirs, it was always just the same, like, five fucking tunes. It's like, you know, close to the edge, and, you know, and and you and I, and, um, you know, maybe, you know, Siberian Katru and, like, a few others that were just, you know, all good people, that kind of thing. It's like, that's the show, <laughs> you know? <laughs> they play Starship Trooper to end the show. And that's, like, every live album from Yes, over and over and over again on, on repeat. <laughs> and so I just love and appreciate all of the random tunes that you don't hear them play a lot. So there's those years in 78, or 77, 78, 79, they were really playing a, a, a bulk of, they had finally, you know, made a lot of albums. They were like on their fourth, fifth, sixth albums. So a lot of material to pick from. You know, they play Going for the One. They play Time and a Word. You know, it's it's cool. Parallels, Don't Kill the Whale, uh, The Rituals Part 1 and 2, which takes over like the, the seaside, I think, on the second disc. Uh, but of course, you know, Gates of Delirium is the entire B-side of the first disc. I don't know. It's just dope. This is just, I like this one so much better than Yes songs. So, yeah, whatever. Fuck me. Most Yes fans will yell at me and hate me for that. But uh, it's my opinion, man. Love this gatefold. Beautiful Roger Dean artwork. Uh, that's the Siberian catcher there, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Just, uh, they were on something, man for uh, Gates of Delirium and their tempos on that fucking song. Woo! That that song is fucking just smoking, dude. Yeah. Probably my favorite live rendition of Gates of Delirium is on this album. 1975, dude. Woo! Alan White was <laughs> on some fucking white drugs for sure. <laughs> Pretty cool. Favorite live album. Thanks again. Sorry, yeah, I didn't even say released in 1980. 
Uh, so collection of tunes from 74, 75, 76, 78. Um, yeah, I'll stop blabbering at you guys. You've been great. Thanks again. Go visit me on Instagram. Do my contest. Uh, I'd love to uh, see you guys down the line. Chit chat, talk music with you. Comment. Let's make friends in the comments. <laughs> love you guys. Peace be with you.